All right. Perfect. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, appreciate uh, everybody per, uh, joining today and just uh, spend, spending some time with uh, with Brideve and, and BNS to uh, to talk a little bit today about, you know, access control in the cloud. So, you know, what are the the methods, the philosophies? Um, you know, what are some of the the kind of um, you know ways that that you know we can best uh, put a strategy together to control access to the cloud. Um, you know, and again, today we're joined by a couple of uh, esteemed panelists. Um, first is, uh, is, is uh, John Morton. So, John, maybe I'll just give you a moment to introduce yourself, and then we'll kind of get in a little bit of housekeeping and then get into the meat of the discussion. So, John, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Hey, everybody. Uh, John Morton here with Brightiv, um Field CTO. It means really bridging the gap between sales and engineering as an evangelist and advocate for uh, customers looking to really you know, focus on cloud access management. Perfect. Thanks, John. And Sean Butler, I'll give you a moment just to introduce yourself in, in BNS. Sounds great. Yes. Uh, good day to everyone, to the uh, attendees. Excited to be here. Sean Butler, VP of Architecture and Analytics for BNS. And, um, you know, for me and what I do on a daily basis is firmly rooted in um, access vulnerability and data management, uh, architecture, analytics, topology, and really looking at those interdependencies in order to establish an interoperable ecosystem. Awesome, thank you, Sean. Really looking forward to getting both of your perspectives uh, on the uh, on the discussion and the topics today. A uh, little bit of housekeeping before we kind of get into the the discussion itself. Um, you know, what is Brightiv, right? Here at Brightiv, we provide a cloud native service that, you know, provides discovery as well as just in time permissioning across, you know, many different cloud services. And, and so that's kind of as we talk about that just in time authorization and access, you know, that'll be very relevant to, to the discussion today. But why don't we just take a moment before we jump into the, the discussion uh, for the broader audience? Let's go ahead and just kind of Give a, a quick visual of what are you know some of the models in, in the in the ways to provide uh, and control access control. So I think today we're going to be focusing on a few different models that we we've seen growing in popularity. Some are tried and true. Some are more emerging. Uh, but today we really want to look at the different models around access control. So you know there's role based access control. Obviously I won't read through all of these, but you know. That's really based on roles, right? A collection of of authorizations that base that's based off a particular role, rather than having that uh, assigned to individual users, right? It's a way to to kind of map uh, roles to access. There's actually kind of this this philosophy called uh, attribute based access control. At that point, now we're looking at attributes both of the subjects or those accessing data or resources as well as the attributes of the objects that they're accessing. So it's kind of looking at attributes and mapping those attributes to provide that access control. And then, you know, now we're, we're really starting to see policy-based access control, which is a bit of a, uh, you know, managing access to one or more systems, mapping those roles, and then applying policy on top of that to provide, you know, a, a basis for who has access uh, to what. So kind of, you know, as we um, as we kind of look at that as a team here, I wanted to start the discussion there. So, uh, you know, let's take a look at this and and really, you know, talking about those three types of access control, right? Um, ABAC, PBAC and RBAC, you know, really what distinguishes those from one another? And, and what are some of the different use cases where those typically apply? So John, maybe if, if you could start out and, and maybe give it the lens of, of from a cloud perspective, right? We're talking about cloud today. I know you spend a lot of time learning and building and, and you know, becoming really an expert across cloud native. When you look at those, those three models, you mm -hmm. know, what do you see as, uh, as you know, some of the, the, the typical ways that those apply to cloud technology? Yeah, absolutely, Jay. So one of the most interesting things about cloud is if anybody remembers Active Directory from 20 years ago, it's literally no different today. And that's kind of where RBAC was born, a fundamental idea that you have an account and that account has permissions that give you access to things. 
What happened with the cloud is it fundamentally shifted how that world operates. Not to say that there's not a cloud journey, there is. There are use cases where folks still lift and shift servers, they lift and shift machines, they're virtualized there. But the real cloud, the microservices have turned that upside down. So basically what microservices have done is they're saying, well, you now have a resource. The resource exists before the access. How would you like to get access to the resource? That's where you start to distinguish things like attributes or even by policy. So you can start with the resource first and build your way back versus the traditional way of start with an account, give it permissions to resources. Yeah, great, great perspective. No, thank you. And Sean, I'm curious, right, from, you know, BNS side, you, you obviously, um, you know, provide these, you know, thought leadership and, and you know, ad advisory services for your clients. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing as, as kind of when you look across these, these models, you know, what are, what do you primarily see amongst your clientele? And what are some of the challenges and some of the gaps that you see? Yeah, um, you know, to John's point, uh, certainly from uh, an adoption perspective, you know, uh, cloud native, uh, it's, you know, primarily we're seeing a lot of uh, organizations firmly rooted in role-based access control um, starting to migrate or embrace attribute-based access control. And uh, there are different reasons for that. Um, one is uh, awareness uh, from um, you know policy configuration management perspective. Um, how do I actually start assigning these tags, as John mentioned, from uh, an ABAC perspective, right? So I would just say you know awareness and you know AWS, for example, does it a little different than say uh, Google Cloud or uh, Azure, right? Uh, if you ask AWS, ABAC is really uh, policy-based access control. Uh, however, I would say that from an RBAC perspective, you still will see a couple of use cases and areas where you would still uh, utilize RBAC, specifically uh, for Kubernetes. So for those who are using uh, Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes touts what they used to call their pod security policy. Uh, now they have deprecated that. I believe that's policy admission control. Mm -hmm. But um, natively speaking, Kubernetes, uh, you can, um, you know, you can enable and configure RBAC for specifically namespaces. Um, but overall, holistically speaking, uh, what are a couple of challenges, right, where it's like, wow, this, this is a constraint, this is a gap that we're still trying to sort out as an organization. Uh, I would say one is at a high level, governance. So you know, having collective buy-in from the various stakeholders in terms of, you know, what should we enable and configure as part of our access control management program, right? Uh, strategy first, program second. So specifically what I mean by that is taking whatever framework you're using, such as NIST or CIS or ISO, uh, all of those frameworks are fantastic and they, uh, you know, clearly state this is what you need to do from an access control management perspective. The challenge, the gap is, okay, how do I start assessing those controls relative to the business risks? And what we mean by that is your business risks, if you're a financial institution, for example, you may have 20 applications that are driving or accounting for 100% of the revenue. So we look at financial risk, which is then dependent on operational risk. And I know we're going to talk more about uh, the world of development operations because yep. we, we have another team that's focused on uh, developing and fine tuning these applications for business to consumers, business to business, and of course, business to uh, employee apps. And then I think last that's a I, good point, Sean. Yeah. yeah. Um, if I could just jump in there to kind sure, of highlight absolutely. that. In, and this is where we see that shift. So why cloud is always that question. Mm -hmm. The advantage is, you know, how dynamic, fast, and ephemeral everything really is. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the yep. governance and tools that existed before focused on that static world I highlighted earlier. Um, you know, so, now, though, there's a huge shift to, you know, any company that hosts video software 
uh, you know, something doesn't work, they don't even bother troubleshooting. Let's just destroy the Kubernetes cluster. Let's destroy the containers. Let's relaunch the node. You know, it is way more ephemeral where there's that fine balance of time to value total cost of ownership of the cloud really streamlines the process. But to your point, Sean, risk is still a priority and a concern, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point, John. And from a Kubernetes perspective, I would say to, um, you know, everyone out, this is just a suggestion. We don't, you know, we don't claim, right, all of us here today, including the attendees, uh, you know, there are multiple solutions. It's not just um, here's one viable solution, but here's a suggestion, right? So, John, to your point, from a Kubernetes perspective, I would say, look, you know, from an organizational perspective, Look at your Kubernetes uh, clusters, look at what's in development, look at how Kubernetes is also being used in production as well, right? Is Kubernetes being used yeah. in production, right? And I, that's, you know, first and foremost, probably um, a starting point for assessing, let's take a look at my ephemeral container environment, whether it's Kubernetes or Docker or, or yeah, other. But, I'm with you, Sean, so yeah. that's where I think, uh... Sorry, Jay, uh, I was just going to say that concept of policy based access control control completely comes into play. Right. Moving away from, well, you have a role as a developer, to your point, exactly. Focusing on the resource. Well, how about we build access when we build the resource as part of the DevOps or, you know, CI CD build process in the pipeline. That's where we start to see some of those advantages of cloud combined with, you know, some of the challenges where you're trying to take a traditional approach to new capabilities. So go ahead, Jay. Man, John, you read my mind. I was literally gonna say, we hear of this as code, right? Infrastructure as code, right? And, and, and I'm almost hearing this idea of policy as code or access as code, right? We're building in the policies around access to code. So I think you've already touched on that, um, you know, which is exactly where I think, uh, you know, we were, we were gonna be, uh, uh, going to. So let, let me ask you this, right? That's a great foundation, I think, for the discussion. I, I, I love the interaction and, and the back and forth here. Um, so what's the starting point, right? Like, as, you know, as we're all kind of going down this path, uh, when you look at, you know, um, trying to develop, you know, these strategies, I mean, what is the starting point to reduce the risks uh, and how do we baseline those risks relative to that managing that access control? So maybe John, I'll start with you. And then Sean, I'd love to get your thoughts on that as well. Yeah. How about we do a little yin and yang? I'll start with the, uh, the side of, I want to build in the cloud and I don't mm -hmm. care about governance and I don't care about risk because that's how we make money. And then maybe Sean, you can come on top of that. So what we consistently see, and you know, Brad, right, we're a cloud hosted solution as well. We operated in fundamentally the same way. We made a decision that, hey, we want to live in a land of cloud from AWS to GCP to Azure. And the first thing from a development mindset we did was said, what capabilities do we have and how can we leverage those? Every single time we looked at those capabilities, they did not align to what you would traditionally do from an RBAC sort of model. So we adopted what was siloed in each cloud about giving that ephemeral access, using the native roles. And then from there, literally, just cutting and pasting because part of the CI CD build process yep. is speed and time to value, right? So it's always about making it work first. And then there comes a point where you realize, are we doing this securely? Yeah, I, th I think that's a, that's a great point, right? The easy button, um, you know, may not be the most secure way to, to, to implement things, right? And, and mm -hmm. kind of that fatigue of, continually trying to assess and create that finite access at an individual resource level becomes, you know, too difficult, too chaotic, and it just kind of becomes the easy button to say, we'll just give over privilege, right? Because it's easier than trying to figure it out. So or maybe they don't even realize it's overprivileged. Good point, Jay. I think a sure. lot of the folks don't realize the scope and scale of the access that they give to humans and non-humans alike. Um, humans is always a good place to start too. And one thing we always see is this interjection where I'll ask a basic question, um, you know, are you aware of the capabilities that a service principal like a Lambda function actually has in AWS or a service principal in Azure or a service account in, in GCP? And fundamentally, folks kind of look at me sideways at first because you would think I can't 
do anything with these functions, but you can. These non-humans oftentimes are more powerful than the actual human. And governance, unfortunately, I haven't seen really many that focus on the non-human aspect. So we start to productize and weaponize the non-human functions to do the things we want them to do fast with no understanding really of what they have as far as privileges or scope. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Sean, any, and you know, I see you shaking your head over there every once in a while. Anything <laughs> to add to that or any thoughts to, to kind of expand upon? Yeah. Um, everything you and John are talking about definitely resonates totally in agreement and, you know, it's just part of the challenge, but also to John's point, uh, this is really the starting point. It's really understanding the psychology, the culture, if you will, of the organization, because, uh, you know, contrary maybe to popular belief, uh, it's not out of, um, you know, negligence intentionally. It just, it just could be, you know, awareness. Hey, I, I'm on the dev team. I'm a front end developer. This is what I was hired to do. Right. And I'm, I'm here to just build the front end to this application and fine tune it. I would say, um, if you don't mind, uh, maybe Marcella, if you could pull up that um, diagram and we could take, you know, a little uh, closer look. Reason being is uh, some of this can be very abstract, right? Uh, where it's like, hmm, how do we piece this together? How do we see mm -hmm. the end to end, the interdependencies? Because really uh, i believe at the end of the day what we're going for and i'll just quickly run through this we talked about governance so okay what's the starting point what are the business risks what we what we mean by that is uh you've got different types of risks look at your applications if applications are driving a bulk of the revenue there's an operational dependency a legal and also a brand reputation dependency also remember, since we're talking about just development and we're spinning up different uh, resources and services and multiple cloud providers, let's remember that code is data. Code is your intellectual property, right? So if we have users interacting with code and code has been uh, dispersed across different repos like GitHub, GitLab, using native cloud CICD pipelines, that's also a good starting point. John mentioned humans and non-humans as we see over here to the left. Well, from a B2B perspective, even from a business to consumer perspective, you've got APIs making calls, non-human IDs, if you will. Uh, what type of access, what type of data am I presenting uh, when I do uh, get requests or what am I posting, I should say, if somebody is doing a get request in API. But let's take a closer look at this um, central point right here, which is where Brightif plays. Uh, and we just abbreviated that as privileged access management, not to diminish what Brightif does, but this is where we really get into the starting point for this topic and for this discussion, which is I have to think about secrets management, my passwords, yeah. my tokens, my certificates, how are those currently being managed? So if you're thinking, what's the starting point? Let's take a look at your secrets. How is that being vaulted? Is auditing occurring, right? Then we can start going down. And again, always tie it back to the data, the applications, and those identities. Then we can start looking at policy enforcement. What fits best for this, what we look at as an end-to-end -end digital process? Right. So an application has numerous controls. Let's think about that, you know, from that perspective, as John mentioned, uh, and Jay, just in time permissions. Well, hey, I am maybe a contractor uh, working in development. Well, maybe I'm only granted privileged access to certain AWS, GCP, Azure resources and services for 90 days or 120 whatever my contract is but you are granting me that token for a specified amount of time that's also a good way to start yeah i like that sean right if if, if i could double yeah. tap on yeah, that yeah. Really double quick, tap. yeah is uh you know um from a security perspective we like to operate i like to operate from the assumption of compromise and we want to remove the low-hanging fruit so you you nailed it sean with uh there's two acts but aspects of access control and uh, RBAC, ABAC and PBAC to me have absolutely nothing to do with authentication in my mind. 
Authentication yep. is one of those controls, though, managing your secrets, your credentials, your tokens, your certs, where Bright of actually layers on top of that. And um, we're pretty proud of is separating out the authorization. OK, you can authenticate. Let's assume someone stole your credentials, stole your token, stole your cert. Once they land in the application, what do they actually have access to do? Do they have least privilege, which is zero access, right? Maybe public access in a database like Snowflake, or maybe just, you know, I can log in to the application. That's where Brightive is really talking about the just-in-time capability, that ephemeral access of whether it's RBAC, ABAC, or PBAC. Whatever privileges you should have in that application, we will give them to you temporarily, and we will take them right away. Right. So, you know, that's the, the I think the sticking point here where we bridge the gap between separating off in authentication with authorization and then in authorization. How do we make it easy for those end users? To your point, Sean, again, if they don't like it, they're not going to adopt it. They're going to find ways around this. They're going to build static access to my functions or my workloads. Let's make it easy for them. Sorry, Sean, I got excited. So go ahead. I love it. Yes. Um, and just for, you know, the audience and, uh, you know, everyone who's listening and hopefully will be participating, interacting soon, um, you know, remember that just from a control perspective, John brought up a really good point. Uh, in terms of authorization, we've seen identity providers. And what we're looking at here is under this access management right here, we have listed authorization. Um, yes, your pings, your octas, your Azure ADs, your others are doing authorization, right? They're doing via SAML or OpenID Connect, for example, authorizing that identity. But remember, your IDP is typically your first line of defense and authorization, right? Some are, some are performing um, strong authentication as well. You don't necessarily need a separate MFA vendor to do this, right? But where John is going is that this is where Brightif comes into play to bridge that gap between traditional, what I would call access management, which again, this is Gartner, right? The four pillars of IAM access management and privileged access management. We're seeing, we're seeing this convergence. We've been seeing this take place and this convergence of combining traditional PAM, especially when you talk about cloud, to access management is what John was alluding to from that authorization perspective. So think of Brightive as that interoperable piece that acts as really your cloud access proxy, uh, not only for those privileged identities, but can also do the mappings and issue uh, those just-in-time permissions. Yeah, Sean, you, you touched on something really interesting there that I'm starting to see as well, which is, you know, that traditional kind of putting PAM into a bucket of just admin accounts and that sort of thing is really broadening to almost like, you know, high risk accounts, meaning that they're, they're accounts that, you know, maybe don't just have admin privileges, but they're accounts that have access, they're high value accounts maybe is, is a better way to put it, you know, um, you know we've already, we've even started to see you know, um, for just talking about marketing and, you know, customers come to say, man, we really need a better way to control our, you know, our social media accounts, because this is now the reputation of our business. And if that gets compromised, right, that doesn't really fit into that traditional kind of bucket of PAM, but we're starting to see there's a desire to kind of collapse that control of even those high value accounts that really map to business reputation and, and that sort of thing. So that was a really interesting point. Um, you know, that that I'm starting to see as well, uh, kind of emerge from a from a, a, a customer um, standpoint. So, OK, great. Well, I want to I want to be cognizant of the time. This has been a great, great discussion. But I also want to make sure we have time for our audience, maybe to sum things up. You know, if, if you know, we kind of talked about the beginning and, and we recently talked about kind of where to start and some of the gaps and the challenges. Maybe we can just talk about what are some of the key considerations for those, you know, customers out there and, and enterprises out there are really trying to right size and build out their access control policies and methods. You know, maybe if, if Sean or John and we can this can just be a, um, you know, kind of a joint effort, maybe touch on what are some of the key considerations for, you know, enterprises that are going down this journey of, of really, um, you know, building out their access control model. Yeah. 
I'll take number one if you don't mind, Sean. So, uh, like I mentioned, Bright of itself is a, a software company built in the cloud, 100%. And um, establishing a roadmap is critical to any organization when it comes to business value, right? What do you want to be when you grow up as an org? Do you want to have 100 people who manually configure access, who manage things like Active Directory, who do things, or do you want to get to a state of automation? where everything should be turnkey. Someone joins the organization as a human, they get the access they need, you know, managing that life cycle, can we do that automatically, as well as non-humans. Non-humans that potentially can lose their certs, their credentials out online, do we wanna manage that access? Where do we see ourselves, you know, three to five years out is a, a critical question after you've already got the ball rolling. Perfect, yeah, thanks, John. Uh, Sean, any thoughts on you know kind of some of these other other um, items we have we have here? Sure, yeah. You know, uh, number two, baseline analysis, perfect complement. Once you have identified the risks at number one, that's where governance comes into play. What are the risks? How are you treating the risks relative to identity uh, and data lifecycle management? Right, absolutely essential. So when you get into number two, what we mean by baseline analysis is audit and discovery. I don't know what I don't know. What do I have? Yeah. Who, who or what is out there? What are they accessing, right? So uh, doing an audit and discovery of all your identities. Uh, we work with a lot of organizations that are hybrid, uh, still using, as John mentioned before, Active Directory, numerous domain controllers, right? So we're talking about, you know, quote unquote, on-prem Active Directory. Now we're getting into Azure AD. I'm using this as an example. You know, so now we're talking about, I've got, you know, I'll call them just static identities, if you will, with traditional Active Directory. And now I've got these cloud-based ephemeral identities, human and non-human. Um, so let's take a look. If, if you don't have something like that today, uh, in terms of a control that gives you visibility, uh, essentially an inventory of your identities, number two is a, a good starting point. Okay. Great, I'll open it up. I mean, we don't have to go through them all one by one. Any sure, any yeah. of these that you guys really want to, you know, make sure that we highlight or, you know, or, or maybe, you know, some of the things that that customers get stuck doing or don't consider as they go into uh, this journey. Yeah, I would be remiss if I didn't at least highlight that customers don't know what they don't know. And just in time, although it may be a buzzword, the one advantage of the cloud definitively is the ability mm -hmm. to manipulate authorized access just in time. That means these permissions I'm talking about, it's not like it used to be in Active Directory. We can literally give you a permission when you need it and take it away. This is a fundamental, it doesn't matter if it's Salesforce, if it's Octa Super Admin, the, the capabilities of the cloud allow us to do this. And most of our customers aren't aware of that or they don't realize the value of it, right? Uh, to my point again, someone steals your credentials, Awesome. I don't have access. I need to use the broker from Brightup. So that's one worth noting. Definitely. And I would say as a compliment to that part of the life cycle, we talked about it, but just to make it a little bit more explicit is logging and monitoring. That's continuous an integral part for identity access management, data access management, incident and vulnerability management. It all converges. So remember mm -hmm. access management, that's a data source with all of your tools and technologies that can be ingested into an analytics repository, which is something Brightive also does with advanced analytics, which gives you in real time, where should I remediate? What is actually happening? So I know when yeah. we think about data analytics, it still gets lumped into that BI discussion, but data analytics is also embracing these types of use cases, yeah. identity and data. Perfect, Sean. It, and so to put a bow on it, right? Like once you figured out what you want, now you can actually automate policy-based access control into the building of resources. You know, you, you, know you can start to automate that lifecycle process of building in access to what you're doing already automatically, so. Yeah, I think that's a good point, John. You, you kind of touched on it, but I, I think what I'm hearing is you know, the cloud, it, the cloud is different, right? But mm -hmm. that's not a bad thing, right? Because some of the things that it introduces maybe can can provide that, you know, automation, that efficiency 
that, um, you know, just because things were done one way in the past doesn't mean that's that's the right way to do it in the future. Right. And, and so kind of what I'm hearing is, you know, embracing what's out there, some of those new technologies and, and new ways of doing things. Uh, but as you said, Sean, you got to learn about them first. You have to understand them. But once you do, it's really, you know, taking advantage of those, monitoring them and, and you know, taking the time to implement them. So, well, great. Um, you know, great discussion so far. I'd love to maybe open it up to our audience who's kind of been listening in this whole whole time. And, and thanks for, uh, you know, for, for that. We, we always appreciate it. You know, uh, anybody taking time out of their day to, to kind of, you know, hopefully learn a little bit more and, and, and provide some feedback. You know, I'm curious, uh, maybe a general question to the, you know, to the audience is, is if anybody wants to share either, either via chat or, you know, come off mute kind of what are for our audience, what are the types of access controls that have been working in your environment? And what have you seen as a viable solution, you know, either in your current role or in past roles? And uh, if you'd like to raise your hand, go ahead, we'll get that in chat. And then also, if there are any questions for uh, the, the panel here, you can also put those into chat as well. And then we'll collect those here and hopefully take, you know, five or 10 minutes, um, you know, to, you uh, uh, to run through some of those. So I'll just give it a couple of minutes here um, for anybody um, to, you know, raise their hand if they want to talk or to um, post some questions. So let's see. Um, I'm going to see if I can one just, one just figure this out. Ar Arunesh, um, are you there? Can you hear us? Uh, yes, Jake. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, we can. Hey, thank yeah. Arunish. Thank you for uh, for joining. So, yeah, I thought it sounds like you might be willing to share a few of your um, experiences and and uh, thoughts with uh, with the team here. Um, you know, let, like I said, you know, you've been listening in and obviously have great experience in the industry. What are some of the kind of the access control models that you know you've seen working, and, and you know, what are some of the the things that uh, you know you might be able to to share with the team here. Absolutely, and uh, I think like it was a very good discussion so far, and I'll probably uh, <clears throat> uh, put in some of my perspective, right? What the industry really needs, and not so much of like what has happened, but what is like mm -hmm. a step forward, right? And I think we have, we have, we kind of agree in principle that policy as code is 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 the way to go, right? And when you talk about feedback aspect, right? One of the, the key advantages of feedback is you can tie all these pieces together and you can actually, uh, from a controlled access, everything is, is, is a piece of code and then you can structure those policies. And one of my uh, pet use cases is around like, let's say I'm, in a, uh, I, I'm a user or maybe I'm a privileged user and I'm on vacation. Should, you, should my request access should be allowed or not allowed, right? with the control that we currently have. Uh, and again, this is me speaking. I, I don't know the industry in and out, but I don't think so there is any solution which actually takes it to the level of connecting it back to your uh, uh, HR systems. Let's say I'm out of office, right? Should my access be even allowed or not allowed, right? And the other aspect is another policy, which is very interesting is based on where you're connecting from. Let's say you're connecting from office mm -hmm. or you're connecting from home. Uh, based on your locality or where you're connecting from, your access should be kind of dependent on where you're coming from. Office, yes, you, yeah, it's, it's fine that you're controlling your Kubernetes cluster or your MongoDB servers, all those. But if you're connecting from home, uh, yes, you want to enforce like use of MFA or maybe you should not have like admin access working from it should only be done uh, behind the the four uh, within the the constructs of, of 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 a traditional office, right? And some yeah. of this would tie it back to your regu regulation, right? If I'm a if I'm like a trader, for example, I should not be looking at any market data or or my client portfolio from home, right? So those kind of things are are very very important to uh, consider. And and another thing, um, I'm not sure like who was saying, but I think like cloud and containerized workloads haven't really changed much uh, of what was happening say 10, 15 years ago, which was pretty much on-prem. I think the extent has grown further. The complexity has increased and it's 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 up to uh, folks in the identity 
space in in organization think okay what do i what am i protecting and how how do i protect those things right mm -hmm. and the shaft led uh, credentials just in time access is important you are pam yeah. of the world right like the traditional yeah. pams don't scale in this environment right you want to ensure like whether it's it's like credentials or maybe it's certificate those are shaft lived as john was mentioning yeah you create like yeah something. i think that's a good point right it's the scale of the of the traditional pam but also the speed right everything's moving faster in cloud you've got as you mentioned automated things are pieces of code now so you know kind of the the speed at which these things you know process goes from you know minutes to microseconds and you know if if, if the solution that has to grant that just in time you know yeah solution isn't modern and can't keep up then then you end up with a bottleneck all right if another, i could ask uh, another yeah, aspect ahead, in the pam space is, is the psm which is your session margin management most of the regulation mm -hmm. would say okay give me a view of like what was done using a privileged account itself right um, the concept around like session recording anytime you're touching your community's cluster your cloud environment or your uh, even your ssh host right i think mm -hmm. having some sort of session recording it's important from audit perspective like if something goes south how do you prove it to the regulators or auditors like what was done if yeah. it's out of the ordinary yeah i think yeah. i want to double down on that really for you arnish i saw a question come in in chat and the question basically says should these same concepts apply to non-humans so let me take what you said arnish and kind of uh i don't want to necessarily do a plug but here's what we see um imagine in the scenario you just talked to you mentioned a human who happened to be on vacation should they be able to access you know resources like kubernetes but what about all the non-humans what about all these tokens that are accessing things all the time we should be able to and right has this capability to limit time of day specific windows of time as well as ips when you have all this tokenized access that's coming from all over the place accessing these resources most of the folks tend to forget that sort of visibility. And bringing it back to Sean's point as well, it's not enough in Brighto's opinion just to control the authorized permissions of a token in a specific window of time or to an IP. You should also apply defense in depth by feeding those audit logs, like you just mentioned, Arnish, to a smarter tool, right? Like a SIM or something that's capable of interrogating all of this new content and analyzing, you know, is this appropriate? Is it there? Even uh, with session recordings, a lot of the things we see specific to the cloud service providers like Azure, AWS, and GCP is their logs capture everything. So even though you don't necessarily have an agent that's recording the video, right? You still with the cloud have these capabilities of intercepting every commit that comes from CLI, for example. So combining those things together and really like this web of a framework of access control feeding greater visibility, I think you really nailed it, Arnish. The only, the only thing I would add is, you know, let's not forget the humans. Um, this should absolutely apply to non-humans. Most of the hacks we see recently are a lost overprivileged token, lost overprivileged cert, maybe not even lost, inadvertently published to GitHub that was public and taken and reused. So having those sort of controls or visibility is, uh, I think, applicable to both sides of it. Yeah, no, thank you. And, and Aranish, thank you for, you know, lending your, your experience and, and thoughts on this. I think that was, uh, you know, super, super helpful and, and very much appreciated. Um, and John, you actually already touched on, on the question that came in. So, you know, um, I mean, at this, at this point, I haven't seen any other questions coming in. We're about three minutes from whenever we wanted to wrap up anyway. So I think it's now's a natural time to, you know, wrap up the discussion Aranish, thank you so much for joining in. John and Sean, as always, pleasure speaking with you and, and appreciate your thoughts and expertise in this area. If anybody is, is you know, interested in what they heard today or, or really want to learn more about BNS or Brightiv and, and, or, and or both, you know, please feel free to uh, reach out to either or uh, email you see up here. Again, this is going to be uh, you know, uh, included in the follow-up email for all the participants. Um, but uh, again, really, uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Thought it was very relevant and and on point with uh, with topic. And 
you know, just want to thank everybody again for taking some time, both to our panelists, to our niche from our, our audience, and then for the broader audience who took some time to, to learn with us today. So thank you so much, everybody. Have a great rest of the week. And, uh, you know, we'll uh, talk soon. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Again, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you.